Hey everybody, welcome to our lecture about the phylum Cnidaria. Today we're going to be talking about jellies, anemones, and corals, and lots of really interesting cnidarians that fall within this phylum. Uh, cnidaria comes from the Greek word uh, nidi, meaning nettle, in reference to their seeing cells. Over, there are over 10,000 plus species in the world that we know of, and of those species, they are mostly marine, meaning some living in freshwater habitats as well. So within the group, there's going to, well, within the phylum, there's going to be four main groups. So we're going to be looking at anthozoa, which are our corals, cubozoa, which are our box jellies, scyphozoa, which are our regular jellies, and then hydrozoa, uh, which are going to be the synopophores. Um, hydrozoa on the end there, we're looking at like the Portuguese man of war and the hydras. Uh, for the anthozoa, the anemones and corals, uh, Scyphozoa are our moon jellies and purple jellies, and then Cubozoa is going to be the box jellies there. So within Nidaria, there are two major body forms. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we have our polyp, which is usually found in corals and anemones, and even in Hydrozoa. Um, the polyp consists of a calcareous tube or stalk that arises from the pedal disc. It also has a manubrium uh, at the opposite side of the pedal disc, which is the location of the mouth, and the periderm that serves as a covering or protect protection of the pedal disc. So it's basically just like a wearing a shoe, but made of the skin layer. <laughs> the medusa bowel plan, however, is typically found among jellies with, their, with the umbrella shape. So you'll see it's got like a bell and the tentacles hanging down. Um, this bow plan is made up of two layers. The inner layer is the sub umbrella and the external layer is the X umbrella. So if I can, sorry, I'm gonna, here we go. Just so I can kind of better, I'm gonna see how we do here. So. The polyp is gonna be like this body form. Just cling with me here, you guys, bear with me. We're gonna have the pedal disc is gonna be right under here. And then we have our mouth region here, and then we'll have more tentacles coming out. You get it, you get it. Okay, and then the medusa is, you know, your typical bell-shaped, like so. And then on the inside, so the outside, this is the inside layer. This is going to be, here is the sub umbrella, and this is the X umbrella right here. Still trying to figure out this whole annotation. Okay. So within that, we're going to see that they're not going to have the typical um, organs we would see in, I mean, pretty much anything that's not an invertebrate. We should be kind of used to this by now with our invertebrates. Um, but yeah, we're not going to see many of the, the typical uh, internal organs. We are going to be on a radial symmetry, which is gonna be symmetry around a center axis, same as we would see in our starfish. Uh, within the internal cavity, we're gonna, used for respiration. So tentacles and body wall are all going to be gill surface. Uh, the ciliated epidermal cells are going to help facilitate that internal uh, or that respiration within the internal cavity. Uh, ciliated, of course, meaning covered in the tiny hair-like structures, um, which is going to help with um, sensory as well. So these guys don't have a brain or ganglia, which is essentially a brain. It's just a constant ganglia or a concentration of nerve cells that act like a brain. Um, instead, they have a nerve net, which sends messages from cells to cells to initiate stimuli-dependent responses, 
such as self-defense or food acquisition. They also have a gastrovascular cavity with a mouth, but no anus. Um, the question is, how do they get out or how do they get around the concept of what goes in must come out? Um, Nidarians excrete waste products like ammonia through a process of diffusion. So for just a little brush up, diffusion is the movement of material from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. Um, so basically, and I'm gonna draw you guys another lovely picture. So we have our polyp eating, food comes in, food digests. And now we have our, we have our uh, <laughs> nutrients coming in through the layers, essentially. And because there is lacking of the, the ammonia, for example, as a waste product in the environment, um, the waste product is going to start diffusion, diffusion so that we have just now excreted our waste into an area of high concentration, into, or I'm sorry, from an area of high concentration of the waste product into an area in which it has a lower concentration. Hopefully that made sense. <laughs> So within the specialized cells, we're going to see uh, the nidae. They're, the nidae are the cells that perform these defensive or predatory tasks. Um, it's going to be kind of the blanket term for these cells. Um, they do regenerate very fast uh, within as little as 48 hours. Um, as you can imagine, they're going to be important. And much like we think of like bees losing their stingers when they sting something, um, these cells are going to be lost, broken off, sacrificed, um, and need to be regrown to either continue to protect yourself or continue to use them to intake food. Um, so we're gonna have the nematocyst. Uh, those are gonna be the stinging barbed uh, spine cells. The spirocysts are long, sticky, uh, <clears throat> sticky thread-like. Um, they're not going to have cilium, um, so they're not going to have the the little like tiny hair-like structures that are going to be sensitive and uh, kind of like a sensory. Um, so those are only found in anthozoans. And then the cytos, tito, I can't talk today. Tycosist. Uh, are similar to the spirocyst, um, just shorter. So they're going to be that um, sticky as well. And they're only found in the Seranthia, which are tube dwelling anemones. So the nidocyte houses the nida and releases it when stimulated. It may be covered by an operculum. The operculum is this lid right here. Um, operculum is, lack of a better word, tissue-like covering uh, that kind of houses, or not houses, I'm sorry, protects. It opens, it's a hinged-like um, opening. I am all over the place today. I'm sorry. So the operculum is a hinged like lid that covers and protects the nidocyte and the nida before it, or, you know, while it's not being used essentially. Um, the cilium or the trigger hair are mechanoreceptive, meaning when something brushes up against them, it triggers that response. Um, they, there are two types, the cili ciliary cone, uh, which are motile, which means free moving, and the nidocil, which are non-motile, which means they essentially just are stiff and stand there. Um, and then we have our interstitial cells. Um, there's the stem cells that regrow the nidoblasts into nidocysts to replenish um, when we lose, when 
okay, sorry. When the NIDA site uh, releases the NIDA, so then we have the process here, the NIDA site is released and then, and then just this whole thing comes off. And then the interstitial cells down in this area will start regrowing a new nitoblast and it becomes this all over. So in the process, uh, the cilium is going to sense pressure. It's going to cause the nidocyte to open the operculum, which is going to be that little flap that was protecting it, which is going to release the nida. After the nida is released, the interstitial cells grow a new nidoblast, which in turn regrows the nidocyte. In order to avoid stinging everything it touches, a cnidarian may require two different methods of stimulation to release its nida meaning that simply the cilium triggering isn't going to immediately release. Um, if you imagine that would be like every little thing that bumps into them, they're just like immediately, you know, releasing everything they've got. Um, it does take time, uh, you know, like 48 hours is kind of a minimum. Um, so we are going to want to make sure that as we're releasing it, it's only as needed. Um, and then if food is acquired, the animal is going to stuff tentacles with food into its mouth. Um, so they will kind of be putting that into their own body. Um, so it's important that they're kind of immune to themselves um, or not kind of triggering that release at the same time that they're trying to feed themselves. So with zooanthellae, we're going to, or zooxanthellae, I always, all the time, I always skip over the X. Zooxanthellae, uh, let's talk about them a little bit. So we have a mutualistic symbiosis between cnidarians and dinoflagellate algae. Um, they, the algae will live inside of the gastrodermal cells of the cnidarians and typically give the tissue the yellow-brown coloration. Um, the cnidarian provides protection and CO2, but what does the dinoflagellate algae contribute in return for protection and CO2 from the cnidarians? So using the CO2 that the cnidarian is putting off, the algae is going to begin photosynthesis and using that photosynthesis, the algae can provide up to 90% of the nutrients needed by the cnidarian. Um, not enough light is generally reaching the depths that some of these corals are at. And they really begin to rely almost solely on the algae um, providing the photosynthesis and the nutrients that they need based on really just the CO2 output. Um, the zoo chlorellae are green algae found in some hydra, anemones, and freshwater sponges as well. So let's talk about reproduction. In asexual reproduction, there are three ways cnidarians go about it. These are a form of cloning themselves. Fission, budding, and fragmentation are the three forms. Um, during fission, the individual will divide itself into parts and regenerate cells to close off the divided site, if that makes sense. So, you know, you don't have an open flesh wound going on. They're closing themselves back up after division. Um, during budding is when the parent organism grows a mini version of itself on its body and that little mini-me breaks off once developed enough and settles somewhere nearby. Uh, so essentially you are growing little mini versions of yourself, they break off, and then you have a small army of yourself all around you. Um, fragmentation is where a piece of the parent breaks off but just has enough, or has just enough of its stem cells to make that broken piece a new individual. So kind of the same thing, but not really. Um, if you 
essentially if like your finger breaks off and then you have like a whole, you know, there's enough stem cells in there, or uh, let's say hand, finger is probably an awful example. Say your hand breaks off, but it's, you know, it's got just enough of those cells, maybe like a sliver of those cells that can reproduce a whole other student. Um, and that's, that's basically fragmentation. Uh, all of these forms are asexual reproduction, obviously do not require a second individual's genetics and only carry those genetics of that single parent. So sexual reproduction is possible as well. We're going to see um, sometimes uh, gonochorific, which is going to be just our two specific sexes. Um, some are going to be hermaphroditic as well. Um, not always in the going male to female or female to male, but in the um, being able to release either gamete, I should say, uh, being able to broadcast spawn and release either uh, egg or sperm um, type hermaphrodism there. Um, and then external fertilization through broadcast spawning mainly, um, again, can be done as an individual, just kind of throwing yourself out into the wind, or it can be done in groups um, where billions and billions of, you know, gametes will be released out into the water. So during development, uh, lecanthropic, or I'm sorry, we have our planula stage. Um, we have the, the planula stage can be larval, planktonic, uh, maybe lecanthropic, Lecithotrophic, sorry, words are hard today. Lecithotrophic or planktotrophic. Um, Lecithro, oh my gosh, I'm, I say this word and for, in my head and for some reason I can't get it out. Uh, <laughs> Lecithotrophic, meaning its only source of sustenance comes from its own yolk, and planktotrophic larva feed typically on phyto or zooplankton for sustenance. So those are your differences between planktonic uh, or planktotrophic and lecithrotrophic. So can't say it. Moving on. So during our juvenile stage, uh, we're going to be just assess a little polyp, just kind of immobile. Um, I love this little picture because I, I don't know, I think it looks adorable. <laughs> Um, but we're going to have the, the basic kind of polyp body, small mouth, little, little jelly bud going on. Um, but we definitely haven't reached any sort of body shape that we recognize as what we're heading towards just yet. So developing into the adult stage, um, we have sessile benthic polyps, uh, which would be most cnidarians, or motile medusas, which would be our jellies. So sessile and benthic, uh, we've touched on them, just going to kind of refresh. Um, basically meaning moving, in, or not moving around, just kind of staying stationary or within one region. Um, benthic meaning seafloor. Um, and then we have motile jellies, meaning, you know, they're free swimming, floating, etc. They're, they're not, you know, sitting still. So we do have regeneration abilities, um, as we've seen in a lot of our invertebrates, um, just these incredible healing abilities. Um, so capable of being dissected and returned to an aquarium after, and regrowing everything, including the mouth. Um, <clears throat> regrowing rather fast as well. Um, again, similar to what we talk about in uh, starfish, where as long as there's, you know, a certain amount of the, I guess, I can't think of the word, but what we talk about is there's 
a certain part of a centerpiece um, being able to regrow from that. Um, so seeing like heads intact, just enough, um, go ahead and, you know, dissect it, throw it back in the aquarium and it's going to regrow. And a lot of, sadly, a lot of this like research was done um, with literally doing just that. And a lot of, um, I want to say like axolotls and stuff like that as well. Um, just kind of testing the limits of this and I mean stuff still being done and research still being done to see just how many cells need to be retained, how many pieces we can, you know, cut these things into and what we can make happen. Um, just like, you know, we chopped up starfish and stuck them back in the ocean and thought we were making it better and we ended up with twice the problem. Um, so there's a lot to learn here still. And we're gonna, I'm actually gonna bring this up way later in the lecture, um, but this is, there's so much about regeneration that we just, we're still learning and, and we've known about it for a long time. This is definitely a middle school science lab kind of things um, I remember doing, but so with regeneration, they use their epithelial cells. Um, these are the organizer, or I'm sorry, the organizer of these cells is the source of embryonic growth in higher animals. So basically stem cells. Um, and this adaptation allows some of these animals to live for more than 4,000 years. And again, I'm going to touch on this later. Uh, just keep this in the, like tuck this away in the side of your brain because this is really interesting stuff. So we're moving into classes, going to get a little bit specific as we go along here. So the Anthozoa, um, Greek for flower animals, as you can see in the photos here, why they would get that name. This is going to be our anemones, corals, sea pens, and sea fans. So in the top left, that's the Gargonian coral. Bottom left is going to be sea fan. Top right is going to be a bubble tip anemone. And then the bottom right is going to be a C pen. And I think that that bubble tip anemone is absolutely the coolest thing in the world. I think all these are super beautiful. You know, Nidarians really don't get a little enough biased. Credit. Yeah. So exclusively, ugh, exclusively found in marine environments, uh, anthozoans appear in the fossil record about 550 million odd years ago. Um, today's true corals evolved alongside dinosaurs. So, oh, once we start, just once we start explaining, you'll you'll totally get it. These guys didn't need to evolve much um, just to survive and you'll find out why. So in our bow plan here we are going to be polyps only, no medusal stage, uh, the pedal disc uh, as we've talked about before that kind of broad flat base it's going to be opposite of our kind of our mouth side is going to adhere to whatever substrate um, this is going to kind of lock them in and make sure that they're not just floating away when they don't want to be. Uh, we're going to see tentacles, uh, retractable or extendable to be able to bring food to their mouth. And then upon retraction, the oral disc is also retracted, which is going to allow for enzymes to be released to acquire food. So talking about diet and ecology, uh, usually carnivorous polyps. Um, they use their nematocysts to stun their fish or their, their prey. Um, their mucosal strands or tentacles to pull prey into mouth. So they're basically, um, I want to compare it to starfish, but that's kind of more jellies. <laughs> um, so basically once they attach their uh, nematocysts or like the strands to stun the fish. They're pulling those strands back in. Um, and then supplement nutrition with zoo zooxanthellae help. 
So what they cannot get from the fish or other animal foods, they receive from the algae, such as the um, algal byproducts. So with reproduction, Okay. okay. So with, re with reproduction and development, um, as we talked about before, mostly that clonal reproduction, um, so the asexual uh, fission, uh, fragmentation and budding, some will produce larva asexually as well. Uh, during our planula stage, we are going to be, I can't say that word either, less anthropic. Yeah, I got nothing. Um, again, being that they will rely on um, a yolk for feeding development, which is really typical of, again, these benthic animals um, or invertebrates that will be hanging out on the bottom, being at the, the ocean floor and not moving much. They are going to need to, to develop a uh, and feed via that yolk rather than having to kind of find their own food. Um, and then the adult stage still being benthic and sessile polyps and attaching to the substrate with the peel disc, not really moving, um, very unlike the jellies that we're gonna see just kind of like floating through and actively moving as they move into their adult stages of life. So getting into the colonial aspect of these organisms, uh, the cynocircal colonies are what kind of live on the surface of most corals and, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, colonial zooids are connected by the cynozark. Um, selenia allows nutrient transport between polyps, so let's explain that a little bit. Uh, cynozark Cynocircal colonies, sorry, I just completely just got lost. Uh, Cynocircal colonies um, are colonies of zooids connected by a layer of tissue over the stony structure of the anthozoan. And the selenia are networks of tubes that allow nutrient transport between the polyps. So they are living on the surface as kind of like a fleshy layer. Um, and they are taking in, they are just living life on this, on their host, or, host organism. Uh, and they have this little network of how to kind of keep each other going here, hence colonies. So we do see fruticose colonies as well. Uh, fruticose essentially meaning um, upright branches. So these are going to be more complex. The zooids are going to bud from each other and stack laterally and we'll see fixed length or axial budding. Um, axial budding just in, can't really describe this. Um, you can kind of tell from the picture it's hard to like, I, I can't make, I can't make the thought come out. Um, you can, you can move on. I can't, I can't put it into words. It's, it's in my brain, but it's not, it's not making sense with how I want to say it. We'll come back to it. <laughs> okay. So regrouping. And realizing that the picture that I was looking for was on the next slide that's not my slide, we will go ahead and regroup and talk about this right here, which is going to be the examples of our colony resulting from fixed length budding. I am terrible at annotating, guys. And axial polyp, or our axial budding. So in picture C here, um, this is going to be our fixed length budding, which is going to be, um, as this is growing, we are growing in very predetermined and specific uh, kind of patterns, whereas the axial polyp is going to be kind of an undetermined growth rate, and all of our budding after is going to come off of that, but still follow 
um, in that kind of stacking up and moving upright and creating those layers. So going more into the stolenate colonies, um, you'll see the tubular wall here, which is the stolen. Sorry, my annotator. So this is the stolen. Uh, and that, that's containing the uh, sinolentrin or sil, <laughs> words, they're hard. Silenterin, the silenterin. Uh, zooids bud from the stolen at intervals. So you'll see here we have a little zooid budding from the stolen. And um, usually they're small and inconspicuous as you can see here. Um, and that's why we're able to have, or where they are able to have so many little zooids kind of working together. Um, definitely lots more space. So reef building, um, as we form colonies, colonies are going to form reefs. Reefs are formed when corals grow on top of the calcareous skeletons of their ancestors. That sounds so dark <laughs> when it's put like, um, we're gonna see three types of reefs. We have fringing, barrier, and atolls. Um, so fringing reefs are going to be reefs that grow close to the shore, um, generally are going to be shore attached in at least part of them. Um, barrier reefs, um, of course, if you just Google barrier reef, you get a lot about the Great Barrier Reef, um, but barrier is actually just, you know, a type of reef as well, not just the name of it. Um, barrier meaning uh, they will be roughly parallel to shore, However, they are going to be separated from the shoreline with some sort of lagoon or a little body of water. And then the atolls reefs are going to be a ring-shaped reef. Uh, these reefs are going to be the most biologically diverse parts of the ocean and generally going to be the oldest structures in the ocean. So more on reef building. Um, we have some symbiotic relationships going on over here within our reefs, uh, which is actually the one big thing that makes coral reefs, coral reefs, um, the picture that you think of when you hear reefs. Um, some species of fish can avoid being stung and live within the anemone. And as you, as like everybody, I feel like my, their first go-to thought fish would be the clownfish. Um, the zooxanthellae, zoo I'll never see that X, I promise. <laughs> the zooxanthellae and the hermit crabs also have symbiotic relationships within the reefs. Um, clownfish have a mucus over their bodies that add a layer of protection from the, ne the nematosis and provide nutrients to the anemones through waste or dropped food particles. Um, as well as they scare predator fish away from the anemones in a, and in exchange for protection, um, they use their, the stinging tentacles of the anemones. Where the zooxanthellae are concerned, um, they provide camouflage for a lot of anthozoans and um, cnidarians and oftentimes because of a mixture of the zooxanthellae and the stinging cells, basically marketing enough for hermit crabs to place sessile cnidarians on their shells. Um, kind of like wearing a, a suit of armor covered in spikes or um, what are those things, what are those things called? I'm thinking of like those balls with the spikes on them at the end of a chain. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> um, oh yeah, I can't think of the word either. Just basically just walking around with one of those all day. Mace. Um, it's a mace, right? Actually, yeah. And I was going to say, or like a taser bodysuit. It's just the same thing, having like a taser bodysuit. Uh, we can come up with examples all day long. This is, that's like the fun part. <laughs> uh, so um, hermit crabs love to take anemones, or you can see even some coral on this one in the middle picture here. Um, and then we have our hermit crab with the anemone. And then here we have the clownfish and his son 
or his slash her son, um, just kind of acclimating themselves. They will rub their, their bodies up against the tentacles as kind of like a, hey, it's me, it's just me, don't worry about it, like to get themselves used to the stings, but also so the anemone knows what kind of movements are quote unquote safe movements um, or movements of the clownfish who protect it. Um, there's obviously not that complex thinking going on there, but definitely the repetitive stimuli is like, okay, this is a normal, this is a normal sensation. Um, will still sting, but just in case, but you know, and, and in turn, the clownfish are getting used to it with that mucus protection layer. Um, anywho, uh, so yeah, all of these are typical mutualistic symbiosis and all organisms in each example bring something to the table for each other without causing harm, which is what's making this, uh, all three of these kind of like mutualistic rather than parasitic or what have you. So erase those. So on the not fun subject of coral reefs, um, a very real threat right now is going to be uh, the bleaching of the coral reefs. Um, and this isn't bleaching like we're, you know, just dumping bleach. Uh, bleaching is going to be caused by adverse conditions um, many things can cause the corals to respond in this way. So we're looking at under or over illumination um, as light's not hitting the corals the way it used to, or now there's less kind of blocking the sun and more of it is hitting them. Uh, excessive UV exposure, changes in salinity, um, the slightest temperature change um, becoming lethal to the coral. Um, the coral is going to expend or er, in it expel its algae to lower the strain on itself um, and sometimes it can acquire a different algae that's going to take um, less stress however as these corals are expelling algae like no algae means that there's less nutrients or no nutrients for some of them um, and then as we, we start to see the bleaching, the transparent tissue is going to start to show that calcareous exoskeleton. Um, so bleaching really just being the loss of color, what we're referring to here. Um, a lot, a lot we talk about for days and days and days, and a lot of stuff that goes into um, changes in the ocean and changes in our corals. Um, so I do urge you to take the time to learn little things that we can do, um, small stuff like sunscreen that we wear in the oceans and little stuff like that that is damaging our waters and just damaging the things in it. So do your research. Um, I'm not gonna go too far into it because I'll sound like a conspiracy theorist, but definitely take the time just to take a couple minutes and learn all the things that are going on that we have control over and that we can take care of. I'll leave, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> no, I'm glad you brought that up because I have a really fun fact um, at, that came out as a result of a really negative impact that we have had on our whole entire globe. Um, but I'm really glad that you were talking about um, the, I'm sorry, I'm really glad you were talking about the um, bleaching for or expelling of algae for like a less stressful algae um, or just kind of like getting different nutrient acquisition. Um, bleaching is not always a result or does not always result in mortality. Um, small scale bleaching may be an adaptation through algal selection. Um, and then 20 years of recent bleaching linked to global warming. Half of Great Bar the Great Barrier Reef declared dead in 2016. Oh, when I found out about that, I was like in tears because, because the world just doesn't know how much uh, we depend on our reefs for like just oxygen in general, like our oceans. Um, but our reefs play a huge part in our ecosystem as, you know, like the climate, the, <laughs> like every, just our whole entire 
globe. Um, anyway, sorry, I'm all over the place right now. A quarter of Belize Barrier Reef is bleached. Over a fourth of the world's coral reefs are bleached. Um, I have not looked into what uh, my fun fact has, like if this, if my fun fact, don't worry, I'm getting there, um, has changed any of this data. Um, I probably should have though, right? <laughs> so bleaching doesn't always kill the coral. Coral will bleach if pollution or exposure to sunlight is too high or if tides are too low. Um, so this can be a temporary occurrence where the coral expels the zoo zooxanthellae and won't let it come back in until conditions are favorable. When conditions don't become favorable for long enough, the coral might die. But because situations like the sun exposure or low tides may be only temporary, it's possible for the coral to bounce back. Whereas something uncertain like pollution or temperature change or um, global warming <laughs> climate change could be detrimental to um, the coral being able to bounce back. Uh, it, my non-bleaching fun fact um, really sucks because it's COVID related, but at the same time, it's a really positive impact on our on our reefs and a lot of things that are impacted by ecotourism. Um, studies have shown that due to the effects of our recent pandemic, heavily trafficked tourism areas among reefs have not been frequented by tourists in the past year as often, if at all, allowing for reefs to heal and grow due to not being stepped on. So because of lockdowns, because we know what happened during COVID, like the first part of the year, um, everybody was on lockdown, stores closed, 24 hour stores, definitely tourist spots for sure. Um, travel bans happened. And then as you know, these lockdowns were kind of getting a little bit more lifted, like the mask mandates. And then we were, everybody did what? They all started hitting our parks, hitting recreation, um, going outside which is amazing and great but um we still had travel bans in place and so a lot of people who like to go out and do scuba diving on their honeymoons or you know maybe even for research i'm sure scientists and researchers have been impacted by COVID as well but these like disturbances in these ecosystems just by our presence and existence for looking and going ooh and ah look at that fish or look at these pretty colors you know, and we're stepping on things because that's how we transport ourselves. We're walking into the water. We, we might step on li like little pieces of um, fragmentation or the larval um, stages of a lot of, a lot of animals, not even just cnidarians, but ev like any zooxanthellae and uh, zooids, phytoplankton, everything. So in a nutshell, uh, because we don't have fish hiding, um, at the appearance of scuba diving humans or boats. We don't have uh, people stepping on the coral, stepping like disturbing the ecosystems with their bodies. Um, these reefs have been able to heal. Uh, and I don't remember like a percentage, but they were like they were, it was drastic enough for it to be notated in the science, like in the science world, the science community, like articles being written um, due to the lockdowns from COVID, um, a lot of these reefs have been able to kind of heal themselves and, and quote unquote bounce back, start new colonies, start new reefs, you know, then that brings fish, that brings food. Um, just a really great impact, very great impact. But I really want to go back and I encourage um, all the students to go back and maybe check these statistics right here and see and just, you know, let your professor know uh, if you found any new information on the Great Barrier Reef impact impacted by COVID or the Belize Barrier Reef. Um, see if this number has changed too. I'm really curious, I'm gonna look into it, but I really wanna encourage you guys to look into it too, because this is really important, just down to the air that we breathe, honestly. But moving on. So moving into the Scyphozoa, um, these are gonna be part of the clade of the Medusazoa, which is also going to include the Cubozoa. 
Uh, it's Greek for cup animal, which is going to be in reference to its Medusa stage. These are going to include the stalked jellies, the flag mouth jellies, and the root jellies. Um, only about 200 species, so a lot. <clears throat> kind of smaller than some of our other classes that we've talked about. Um, the left hand side here is going to be the stalked jelly. The top right will be the root mouth, and then the bottom right is going to be the flag mouth in that little trio of pictures there. Going into their bow plans, um, these guys have uh, tetramerous tetra symmetry, meaning that you could divide them in half and half again. Those parts would appear identical. Um, internally, their central gastric cavity, there's, uh, sorry, they're, in their central gastric cavity, their cilenteron um, is divided by four septa, which are basically like tissue-like walls that separate organ functions for distribution. Um, I, I remember it by thinking of your nasal septum. Everybody, you know, you might see a lot of people with their septum pierced. That, that is actually literally a septum that divides your nasal cavities, uh, airflow going into your lungs. So think of it that way if it's easy for you. <laughs> um, the septal funnel replaces the pharynx and oral sphincter. Um, and its function is to facilitate fluid into and out of the jelly. So this is kind of helping, this is a, this serves as a mode of obtaining nutrients into the gastric cavities and other systems of the jelly um, so that those nutrients or, you know, can trigger stimuli of what the jelly should be doing, such as reproduction or should I be eating more, should I, you know, all of the things. So with our bow plan, uh, we are going to see the umbrella, which is sometimes scalloped lappets, which allow for greater range of motion. And the ropalia, they're gonna be the sensory lobes found on the medusa, the gastrodermal statocysts. Uh, statocysts are going to be, I don't wanna say sensory, um, but they're also going to play a role in kind of like balance and orientation. Um, mechanoreceptors, of course, being movement reception, uh, chemoreceptor being, um, of course, like chemical, and then photoreceptors, which are going to be light. Um, this is going to help with our gravity equilibrium, um, vibrations, hearing, odor, light detection, um, all of, I would say all of, uh, a lot of what's going to be kind of perceived and taken in um, is going to come from the sensory lobes along the medusa. Diving more into development and some reproduction. Um, Huh, wor more words that I can say in my head, but out loud it's harder. So I hope that some of you can relate. So I apologize. Skyphistome. Skyphistome, small funnel shaped polyp, polyp from, form of skyphozoans. Uh, they can be solitary or colonial, which means they either are their own being or they have colonial species living, or colonial organisms inside of them. Uh, they asexually reproduce uh, or produce medusae through strobulation. So we remember the medusae body, body form. So we're referring to this here with the tentacles. So that is our medusae uh, reproduction. Sorry, let me erase that. And in strobulation, a uh, number of factors trigger this event. Uh, environmental cues are a huge, fa uh, like just numbering factor of how this is triggered. Um, basically, you're not gonna reproduce when all heck is breaking loose and there's not a lot of nutrients around and all the other things. So, um, when conditions are favorable, 
that phrase is going to apply a lot in probably this whole semester. Um, during strebulation, neck formation and segmentation occur simultaneously. So uh, what's happening is, and I, I don't think it's on the, no, it's not on the next slide. So basically what we have is we have our, our little polyp floating down to the ground over here in the corner. Here's the sea floor, our benthic region. And so what's happening is these, this neck is kind of forming here. And also segmentation is occurring. So <laughs> just forgive me with the drawing, but think of it like a worm that ha is growing off of a stalk. And really the purpose of the stalk is to keep it kind of uh, sessile so that it, it can, it doesn't have to worry about, you know, floating around and orienting and also trying to reproduce. So these segmentations here, what they're doing is at the top. So we'll have like some kind of, it almost looks like when you pull, forgive the uh, description, but when you pull like a grilled cheese apart or uh, like slime, if I don't know if you've ever played with slime, but when you're pulling slime apart, kind of looks like that. And it starts kind of doing that down here. And that's literally our polyp splitting itself into our medusae polyp. Okay, there we go. Um, I'm sorry, that didn't make sense. Our medusae, not polyp. So uh, from there, it begins the process, process of fission in which the segment of the polyp begins a morphological reordering of lobes and body systems to produce a new individual at the uppermost end of the polyp. And this is called the ephyra. Um, the division process happens repetitively, producing as many ephyra as the individual is able. And so, with that, um, hold on one second, I got to draw another one. Uh, I'm, thank you so much for bearing with me, everyone, on this. So with that, so we have our, our Medusae has broken off and joined the free world. And we have a little baby. But, um, so, so with, uh, with this, within <laughs> scyphozoans, um, typically, from what I've researched, typically the smaller the individual, the less reproductive output, but you know, so maybe with my picture, we'll get like what, one, two, three, four, five, uh, we'll get maybe three to five individuals just from this reproductive uh, occurrence event, if you will. Um, the bigger the, the polyp, the more, the more reproductive output, obviously. So hopefully you guys, that made sense. Um, I found a really interesting picture online and that's where I got my awesome picture drawing skills from, but hopefully that helped you guys understand the development of the ethera a little bit better. So speaking of the ethera, uh, that is going to be our juvenile medusa stage. Uh, we are going to see a deeply incised bell margin, which is going to help kind of set these guys apart. Obviously, they're not going to be fully grown, but it's going to help us tell what kind of stage they're in. Um, again, not being sexually mature. Something very important going on in this kind of stage of development, however, is we're no longer sessile and we're no longer stuck. Um, so a big thing for the ephyra is as we've become this medusa, we are going to be able to kind of float away. And this allows for dispersal. Um, so rather than seeing kind of that asexual um, where we see in like budding, uh, where everyone just kind of buds off and falls and you now you're surrounded by a tiny army of yourself, uh, these ephyra are really going to be able to disperse and move into a stable new habitat before reaching their adulthood.
so the Medusa stage uh, is unique to Medusazoans. Um, they are gonochoric with sexual reproduction. So as we've mentioned before, uh, they have a distinct sex, male or female. Um, gametes are spawned from oral opening. So from, so here, I believe are the gonads right here. Um, and then on the underside, there's your mouth. And um, yeah, basically, as I just said, the gametes respond from the oral opening. And some brood eggs on the surface of the body, which turn into planula. And you'll see this here and there throughout Nidarian um, reproduction. So they'll basically just, if you can see my little red dots on the blue back. So they'll just um, keep their eggs on the surface of their body. And once they've turned into planula, then the planula free swim and mom is free to live the rest of her short life uh, after reproduction. The Medusa bow plan is unique to Medusa zones, as we've said, in their life cycle. Um, sorry, I'm repeating myself. <laughs> so the benefit of the planula being brooded on, or the eggs being brooded on the body surface of the individual, um, basically the benefit is that the they're less likely to be eaten by predators who eat plankton or, um, you know, any microscopic free floating larva um, or egg, fertilized eggs. That way we know, like the mom knows, like, hey, okay, you're hatched, so be free now. Um, at least there's that certainty. Not, again, not that there's a lot of brain power going on behind these guys. They're, they're very uh, stimulus, stim, stimulus driven. Um, but brooding the eggs, the fertile, fertile eggs, on the body is kind of like a certainty, uh, not having tentacles, like a strand of eggs kind of free floating in the water where some, something can come up and just eat it and say, see you later. Um, that is kind of the drawback though, because if the parent is eaten, then the, the fertilized eggs are also eaten. Um, but it's inevitable, the planula are gonna go become zooplankton. So I kind of just, uh, I kind of just went back on what I said there. So hopefully you guys were able to follow though my, my weird kind of off-putting trail there. Uh, moving on. So diet and symbiosis. Uh, diet's going to mainly for adults be small animals such as crustaceans, fish. We will see jellies eat other jellies. Uh, tentacles are passively going to capture prey and attract it to the mouth. Um, while we, while we say they like actively hunt, um, and are hunting, there is a, that passive capability of it as well. Um, all of this works on kind of those mechanoreceptors and chemoreceptors and photoreceptors and all the receptors and all the kinds, um, that kind of just do their job and trigger certain things to happen. So as these guys are floating along, if they are triggered that there is food, they're going to just passively capture that prey and bring it to their mouth and eat it. Uh, larval fish will use jellies as protection. Uh, this is considered a commensal relationship. Uh, they will just kind of hang out inside um, kind of the bell of the jellyfish or the up in the umbrella. Um, we're not going to see the stinging cells affect them. This is really similar to like, of course, the clownfish and the anemones and all of that. Um, there are parasites that will affect these guys. Um, so gooseneck barnacles and amphiopods. Um, I did look into gooseneck barnacles a little bit. I'm trying to find, I did not write my notes apparently. Um, they're, not the only ones affected by it. Give me a second and I'll come back to it because I got to find out where I put these notes. Um, but I was looking into who else is affected by gooseneck barnacles as a parasite.
So resuming, sorry about the brief pause. Um, so with the gooseneck barnacles, um, first of all, they are edible and we eat them, which I find completely disturbing. Um, there's like pictures of them being served at like Spanish restaurants. Um, but besides seeing them in our, in our jellies, uh, horseshoe crabs, uh, whales, and sea snakes in particular, like horseshoe crabs and sea snakes were in the article that I was reading um, that I had jotted notes down on just being affected greatly as well by the barnacles. Diving into class Cubozoa. Uh, Cubozoa is Greek for cube or die animal. Um, some dissent concerning taxonomic placement, and I'm going to dive into that here. Um, traditionally considered a sister taxa to Scyphozoa, but cladistic analysis consi considers it a grouping within Scyphozoa. Um, as cubo medusae. So you see like cubo meaning cube or die um, and die meaning like dice. <laughs> um, and then medusae meaning like the medusa bow plan. Um, and this includes box jellies. Uh, the placement for these guys comes down to morphological differences, which we will get into with the next few slides. Um, they're really one of those classes you will see a lot in the animal kingdom that kind of make their own classification because they share so many physiological character characteristics um, and uh, morphological, like all of those differences but in characteristics, but at the same time, uh, they retain similarities with other organisms just enough to raise questions. There are arguments whether there are sister ta taxa due to differences in their reproduction and life cycle, or if they fall within Scyphozoa as a subgrouping due to morphological similarities. So in the bowel plan, we're going to see distinct synapomorphy, uh, cubic colorless bowel, um, polyps are gonna be tiny and solitary, during the medusa, we're going to see long, slender, hollow tentacles on each corner of the bell. Um, and then the valerium, which is going to restrict the bell to create a powerful jet propulsion. Um, the valerium is kind of like, I describe it almost as like a thin, like skin flap almost. Um, and it's going to create a smaller area which is going to help create that more powerful jet. So talking about their venom, uh, a lot of people kind of uh, associate box jellies with just excruciating pain, like terrible sting stinging venom. Um, they can even be fatal. So they have the nematocysts that have have highly potent venom. Um, Chironix fleckery is also the sea wasp, um, is a, actually a species that came up a lot during my research on box jellies. Uh, found on the Great Barrier Reef, two meter long tentacles, one of the most venomous animals, kills two people per year in less than five minutes, Sting causes excruciating pain, toxin targets nerves, muscles, and heart. So these are neurotoxins. Um, and a lot, like, I'm really uncertain about if this is, I mean, I would imagine that this is a box jelly sting, um, but I can't say for certain because I didn't, I didn't put this slide together, so I apologize. But uh, if this girl, or if this person walks away with just that, they're lucky because all of the research I've been doing on box jellies kind of points to, you know, de death within even four minutes. And um, it just varies depending on like the area. Um, and by area, I should say region. Um, the amount of venom depends on geographical range and species. And the stings from most nidarians can affect humans anywhere on the scale comparable between a bee sting to death. 
but these guys are on definitely leaning towards like the death side um lots of scarring i have a friend who lived off of like the outer banks and she's got a jellyfish sting scar and it's pretty gnarly and i don't even think it was like like you know man of war or box jelly it was just because it's you know very cold ocean um over there in the outer banks uh on the east coast but these guys are primarily found in like the warmer waters uh Actually, they could be found all over, but they typically, like along Australia, um, Japan, uh, the Indo-Pacific, I believe I read. But yeah, definitely not something to mess with. So our common box jelly is going to be in the southeastern U.S., uh, only a couple centimeters in size, and there's been at least one recorded death. I cannot, for the life of me, say this right. It's like, I root. Yeah, I can't. Say it. Yeah, I was like, I can never say it because I sound it out and it doesn't make sense. Um, so the syndrome can be caused by several cubozoans, um, and it's going to be kind of characterized by this like sharp prickling sensation. However, there is no visible injury. So unlike the really intense sting we saw on the previous slide, um, a lot of these box jellies are going to be able to kind of sting and deliver this venom without causing an actual visible irritation. Um, a lot of this venom is going to, again, be a neurotoxin. So we're looking at, um, kind of like back pain, limb cramping, um, nausea, vomiting, headache, restlessness. Um, I find the feeling of impending doom really, really interesting um, because I started to look into um, whereas some of like these neurotoxins are attacking your heart and your muscles and you're going to die quickly. Um, this really is just a miserable, like, throwing up, your head hurts, and there have been a lot of accounts of an actual, like, yeah, a feeling of impending doom, um, which I am trying to look into, and I encourage you, again, to look into. Um, I find it very interesting that there's an emotional kind of response to it, um, but this is a non-life-threatening um, just a kind of different, different uh, venom and different cause. So getting into their movement and eyesight. Um, that's right, guys. These guys have eyes. Uh, most jellies are planktonic. Ox jellies are active swimmers. Some can swim as fast as two meters per second. Um, we never really give this much thought because we never see them, but it's true. A lot of zooplankton are various species of jellies or cnidarian larvae, um, and they feed on other plankton species. So it's just basically a giant Hunger Games, but like a carnivorous Hunger Games. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just, just go with me here. Just let me have it. Um, some species are extremely fast swimmers, while others are known for their elegant and majestic slow movement. Typically, that's the bigger ones. Um, you'll see those giant, like, five meter cross. I don't really know, like, the actual measurements, but you know, those pictures of those great humongous jellies just kind of looking like when you drop ink into water and just, it's just so beautiful and majestic. That's because they're huge and they're literally just floating through and the water currents are moving their parts more so than um, these guys who actually have like jet propulsion. Um, smaller size usually comes with motion uh, or quicker motion for jellies, but especially jellies that have adapted to swim and move. So moving further into kind of the movement in eyesight, um, they're known to evade capture. And again, using that statocyst, which is a sensory organ, as well as their eyes, so really like just having eyesight and enough of a sensory to know that something's coming at you 
um, they have developed enough to be able to kind of evade capture rather than just be free floating like some of the other Nigerians we've seen. Um, and they do have the most developed eyesight out of the Nigerians, uh, multiple ocelli. Um, as seen in most Nigeria, however, there's two to four complex imaging, image forming eyes with cornea lens and retina. And they will appear to rest their eyes by sleeping at night, um, which isn't something that we had seen in, um, you know, classes prior to this, um, getting a lot more complex and developed as we're reaching kind of more complex and developed, you know, venoms and body styles and getting into as well, like these larger, um, these larger jellies, um, which brings up that potentially reaching these body shapes because, or these body sizes and being able to be so big, partially because we are now almost actively avoiding being eaten and actively being able to hunt and kind of take in more, more of the world, if you will. But we will get into that in evolution shortly as well. So these guys will use a combination of agility and sight, which kind of turn into unusual mating for Nidarians. Um, they pair up, many display sexual dimorphism, and uh, the pairs will entangle tentacles. So they're basically finding like, oh, you're you're a male, I'm a female. All right, you know, let's let's dance. And then they entangle their tentacles um, for, you know, easier reproduction um, occurrence. So they're not losing each other in the currents and everything. Uh, the male pass a spermatophore packet to the female. Um, internal fertilization is found in at least one species. Uh, I know there's like a couple that have been noted. Um, Sometimes they do this in large aggregations. So in a nutshell, typically most Nidarians that reproduce sexually, or I should, sorry, um, talking about these jellies specifically, uh, most of them that reproduce sexually are broadcast spawners who send their gametes out into the open seas and hope for the best. Uh, sometimes this is a group effort where everyone at the party is doing this at once. Then you have cubozoa, sometimes, or some species have been noted to entangle themselves together with an opposite sex individual. And as they swim together, the male shoves a packet of spermatophores into the female's stomach. Fun fact, the sperm packet on a species found near Japan has been noted to have non-venomous stinging cells on his packets. Scientists believe the purpose of the nematocysts is to hold the packet in place within the female until fertilization occurs. And like good for the female that it doesn't sting her. So they really just believe that it's just to kind of stick it into place. Um, the female uh, then her body starts kind of dissolving the, the packet of sperm uh, or spermatophores and the nucleus or the nuclei start traveling to her eggs. So that is how the internal fertilization occurs on some of these cubozoans. Um, definitely pretty interesting. Uh, some of them have, we'll talk about it I think on the next slide, uh, so I won't spoil the fun, but uh, I know this species pictured will lay, or I'm sorry, she will then thread her eggs uh, out of her and then they will hatch or the, yeah they will hatch into the planula but let's go to the next slide for a really super fun fact about these guys so we'll see um, embryo being released into the water column um, as well as some developing in the bell of the mother um, i actually tried to research this a little bit um, and I'll have to get with Alex to see what his example is, um, because trying to Google in any form Sorry guys, my internet had cut out. <laughs> 
Um, but as I was saying, um, I will get with Alex and see about getting some examples for developing in the bell of the mother um, because Googling that in any form just did not, did not bring up the information I was seeking and I don't have enough books on jellyfish apparently to um, find specific examples. Um, but much like I did find like a picture, but I could not identify the species myself. Um, similar to how we saw the fish kind of just like hanging out within the bell, it looks a little bit like that. There's literally just little baby embryo hanging out within um, the bell of the mom. Evolution, multiple complex characteristics. So let's just, yeah, I'm just going to read the words on this slide and then kind of spit my own takes. Um, why? So science does not know. Invertebrates aren't well researched. Most research is done on their venom. So I'm probably going to repeat this, forgive me, but yeah, these guys have multiple complex characteristics. They have developed eye clusters, the ability to move rather than float freely through the water, and their venom is incredibly detrimental. But why? All for what? I, we develop all of our characteristics for a well, most of our characteristics for um, survivability and reproductive reasons. Um, but unfortunately, invertebrates aren't well researched and most research is done on their venom to come up with the theories on why these complex characteristics were developed. So we do have some theories. Um, naturally, habitat is going to play a big role in that. Um, as you can imagine, the area an animal is going to be found in is obviously going to play a part in what ad adaptations they will develop. Uh, most of these jellies are going to live in the open ocean. Uh, we're going to see the box jellies living closer to shore. So box jellies obviously going to develop a little bit differently than a lot of the jellies we see out in the open ocean. Uh, shallow waters having more obstacles. Um, as there's more to kind of navigate, more to figure out, having that more developed eyesight, again, going to help. Many are going to use landmarks above the water, including stars. Again, needing eyesight in these further developed um, receptors and photoreceptors even. Um, we're going to see active hunting. So before there was kind of more of a passive um, take on things but here we see a lot of like we talked about the the jet propulsion and being able to kind of move um whether we're escaping predators or we're actively hunting um, a lot going on that needs to happen um for them to kind of maintain this this uh quality of life if you will um and then in reproduction they need to identify mates really sucks to do your little song and dance to a same-sex partner. Um, so where we see like a lot of sexual dimorphism in kind of like birds or mammals, stuff like that, um, they're going to need to be able to identify each other in similar ways. Um, and then precise sperm transfers as well. Um, not so much broadcast spawning and just throwing yourself to the wind, but needing to know that your sperm packet is going to exactly the precise location you want it to and that you're actually going to get something out of it. So a lot going on as to why, kind of why they are more developed, why we've gotten this far um, compared to other, other species. So moving through to hydrozoa, um, these guys are insane. So earlier we were talking about regeneration. Yeah, I'll just wait. It's coming. Um, so hydrozoa, hydro is Greek for water animal, um, around 3,000 plus species are discovered slash known about um, by scientists. And hydrozoa includes fire coral, hydra, um, Portuguese man of war, by the wind sailors, and they are the only night to form colonies with 
either Medusa and Polyp or Polyp um, body plans. So they can either be solitary, just to kind of like note on that, they can either be their own individual or they can um, form colonies uh, or their bodies can be made up of colonies of zooids and they can either occupy the medusa or polyp body structure. So with the bowel plan, we're going to see mostly colonial medusazoans. Um, a few solitary species, uh, generally polyp zooids, which are going to have a pedicel um, that's going to be kind of our stock. And then the hydrant with the manubrium. The hydrant is the, I want to say, the terminal end um, that's going to have kind of like the mouth and tentacles and be what acquires food. Um, so we'll have our stock and that's going to kind of end in that hydrant. So hydroids are mostly marine. Um, they're the only cnidarians to have freshwater species. So if you see freshwater jellies, uh, they're hydroids um, and they don't really fall into, but I believe they don't really fall into um, like the other jelly categories. Uh, epidermal nematosis. Nematocysts, sorry. Um, of 30 described types of nematocysts, there are 23 are found in hydrozoa. Um, they have, what is it? Uh, they have these, th they, okay, so they produce this, okay, I'm just going to define the word, sorry. Okay, so they use a nematocyst called glutinance, which, like the name, implies stickiness. That's what I was trying to get out. They secrete a sticky substance onto their threads, which help cling onto food or solid objects better. Um, this also helps aid in locomotion and inject predators or prey with their hypnotoxin. So our hydrates are going to be sessile, benthic, and seaweed-like. Um, growing profusely, particularly around other structures. They are considered biofowlers, which are what we um, look as, I want to say like parasitic, but biofowlers is going to be kind of like muscles and the things that attach themselves to places that they shouldn't be. So they're going to like inhibit machinery from working properly, um, going to need to be cleaned off, removed, um, empty. Uh, a lot of like ship hulls and stuff like that as well. Are you able to hear me? I can't tell if my internet's being funny again.
So we're coming back to the L form and the A form because of my end of technical difficulties. I apologize. So we have the L forms versus the A forms within the hydroids. The L forms of hydroids are fecate, meaning they possess a theca or protective sheath to withdraw polyps into uh, themselves during a threat. So there is some movie uh, that I was trying to recall, probably The Little Mermaid or something Disney, uh, where there was some action going on along the reef and all of these hydras just kind of like sucked in, all like the clams shut, everything kind of sucked into their shells. Um, and that's basically the the theory behind the L form. Um, or, I mean, it's not a theory, it's, it is what it is. So basically the the uh, polyps, you know, withdraw, retract into the theca, and you're left with this kind of straw looking mechanism or individual. And then you have your A forms, which are athecate, meaning they cannot withdraw their polyps into themselves because they lack a theca. So they're just kind of free swimming and out in the open. So we're going to have monomorphic colonies, uh, which are, of course, Bono being one, uh, one morph type, if you will, uh, which are going to be gastrozooids. Gastrozooids are specialized to be like feeding or, I guess, nutrient based, um, food obviously being necessary for survival. And they're going to form medusa buds. Um, a medusa bud is either going to become a medusa or a gonopore. The polymorphic colonies have multiple types of zooids that each carry out a function. So we have our gonozooids that contain gonophores, and we know gono typically means uh, reproductive cells or parts. So they're going to be responsible for primarily reproduction um, or, you know, reproductive like occurrences. Um, Dactylozooids offer protection in food acquisition and then the nematophores offer the same line of protection as the dactylozooids but on a lower level so kind of like a second line of defense so to speak. So we're gonna have uh, all colonial polymorphic A form. Um, they're gonna be mostly pelagic. Uh, functional specialization allows the individual zooids to act as one animal. Um, so, as we see with like the gastrozooid being like a feeding specialization, um, using these functional specializations, um, these individual zooids can all meet their individual needs and kind of function as one. Um, they're going to be hermaphroditic, so each gonozooid has male and female gonads, um, as we talked about before with like broadcast spawners, um, and that level of like hermaphroditity, I guess, <laughs> if, you, if you would. Um, they're simply going to have the ability to release sperm, egg, either or, um, as they broadcast spawn. Siphonophores have six types of nematos nematocysts. Each one obviously has a different structure and function, but all aid in the acquisition of food and transport for digestion. Um, so off the top of my head, uh, because when I was doing all of my research, uh, I honestly could only find like four of six. Um, but I do, I was able to find the information about how each one of the nematocysts have different size spears, threads, some don't, some do, um, some are sticky, some are not. Uh, and they each have kind of like their own purpose, almost like fishing. Actually, it's almost exactly like fishing. Uh, so if you accept, you know, if you're encountering a big prey source, you're not going to sit there and be like, okay, for that big fish, I'm going to, I mean, 
fishermen will. They'll sit and be like, all right, I want to catch a giant shark. So I, you know, big fish, big hook, big bait. Or I need something shiny because that's what attracts these, these other kind of fish and they're decent sized. Or I'm just, you know, doing some small fishing just, you know, for sport, you know, so I'm going to use a typical small hook and a worm and all those other things. So like that's, that is essentially how the nematocyst kind of function for siphonophores. Um, except for it's all like direct contact triggering. So, you know, if something bigger kind of comes along, they, the appropriate nematocysts are triggered. Um, I mean, they're probably all triggered, but the appropriate sized one or the appropriate one for the job, uh, so to speak, will function and help in food acquisition. And then if it's smaller, um, the bigger, hooked barbed or threaded ones won't be able to hold on to something so so small but the smaller uh or you know again the nematocysts that have the correct tools for the job are going to get the job done so hopefully that made sense i like to draw verbal pictures so thank you for bearing with me with hydra uh, we're going to see small solitary polyps that exist in fresh water. Um, and again, we're looking at these regeneration, um, which kind of gives them their name. Um, head can reform from the pedal disc. So whereas before we kind of saw the need to have at least a small part of a certain cell here we, as you can see in the picture, um, can essentially just cut the thing in half and without retaining pieces of head structure are capable of reforming that part of the body from really the pedal disc, from what's just attached to the substrate, um, which is kind of, I don't want to say groundbreaking because obviously it's been happening for a long time, um, but just, just let that sink in, <laughs> like that regeneration of something came by and just nibbled your, your little noggin off and you keep your pedal disc attached and you just keep living your life and you get an entire new head and then you continue to live your life. I think hydras are super cool. Oh yeah, just wait. They, they really don't. For as simplistic of an animal as they are, they're, they really don't get the credit deserved, I suppose. The slide in reference to earlier. Um, so hydra are possibly immortal, non-senescent. Um, I will define senescent for you in a moment. Uh, it basically means do not show aging and can reproduce no matter how old. Um, it dives a little deeper than that, though. Uh, disproves the theory that as multicellular organisms age, mortali mortality increases and fertility decreases. Hydra have played such a huge part in um, like biochem and genetics and just any kind of study where it comes to like immortality or you know just cellular structure um regeneration so they've been theorized to be uh non senescent which means not aging or showing signs of aging uh it's about to get biochemical for a minute so put on your seatbelts and try to bear it with me it's believed that because hydra cells have the ability to divide consistently as a form of asexual reproduction or regeneration that they utilize an enzyme called telomeres. Uh, I'll spell it for you because I'm not even sure if I'm saying it right. And if anybody wants to Google, which this is like a rabbit hole. So I, I suggest if you've watched all your Netflix and you've read all your books, uh, Google this because it's really cool. Uh, T-E-L-O-M-E-R-A-S-E, -E, telomeres, um, known to exist in immortal cells which are actually just a nickname for like mutated cells that just keep dividing. Uh, this enzyme counteracts the shortening of telomeres. Why bring all of this up? 
because telomeres are what I like to think of as the caps of the ends of chromosome pairs, which help the genetic material not mutate or like rearrange or get all crazy up in there. Um, telomeres get shorter upon cell division and cell division happens constantly as organisms grow. So right now it's happening. We're all dividing ourselves. Um, scientists have researched and le leaned towards the theory that hydras utilize the telomeres enzyme to counter the shortening of telomeres, thus essentially making them immortal. Um, it's likely possible for them to hone their immortality because they are so simple. They put their energy into eating and regenerating and reproducing. Uh, not so much paying bills and keeping their children alive and in school and driving and, you know, all the things. Uh, so being a complex creature has its advantages, but so does being extremely simple, like a hydra. Um, you have this, like, transparent, translucent, translucent individual. It's a stalk with some spaghetti at the end, like, and you can see through it with a microscope and flashlight or whatever. And then you look right here. So I was bringing up the telomeres. So you see the word telomeres. And this is what I'm talking about with like the little cap at the end of our genetic ladders. So they're born, I mean born, <laughs> when you're, when an individual is created or, you know, cells, chromosomes begin to be created, uh, these caps are a length, right? They're a length like this. And as cell division happens, as we grow older, so like, okay, you're five years old, so now they're this big. And you're 15 years old, so now they're this big. Um, and then you're 40 years old, and now they're this big, right? About life, we'll say a life expectancy for humans is about like 80, even though it's like 100 or something. Uh, you're 80 now, so maybe you ate your fruits and veggies, never smoked a cigarette, never really drank alcohol, and you were happy your whole life. Those are all things that are factors in the shortening of telomeres besides um, cell division. Research is really a powerful tool that we have the capability of. Um, and that's why I said, if all your Netflix is watched and all your books are read, dive into this rabbit hole because it's nuts. Uh, so telomeres shorten. Um, you, like humans have developed ways to kind of like, <sighs> stunt the shortening or like, you know, prolong um, the shortening of telomeres. And that's why I brought up like, you know, unhealthy habits, stressors, etc. cetera. But um, hydras just use the telomer telomeres uh, to counter. So that enzyme that again is found in the mutating cells that are constantly dividing, um, they have those because they regenerate. Uh, they can you know, on a Tuesday afternoon, get a little sliver and grow a whole nother friend um, during lockdown. Uh, so yeah. And then, so they use that telomeres. I, th I forgot how I spelled it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Tell O um, to counter the shortening. So they, what they have is, this is theirs and like the enzyme, it's like sprinkling a little dash on it. And the telomere, the telomeres are like, no, I guess we don't have to shorten because we got this out. It's basically just like feeding the telomere so it doesn't have to shorten during cell division. So thank you for attending my TED talk on cell division and telomeres. Uh, I definitely found that interesting in my personal research uh, to each their own if you thought it was really silly and boring. Um, I hope not because you, I, I don't know what's going to be on the test. I don't write the tests, but definitely look into it enough. Um, for simplistic animals, um, Cnidarians don't get the credit that they, they deserve. They truly are amazing. And you'll hear that from your professor. You'll hear it from Alex. They really are. They're incredible. So yeah, regeneration and Im immortality has been honed by the most simplistic creatures and we will never achieve that because we put so much energy into our other complex, complex, complex body systems. So, and that is our, that is our lecture on 
night area. I uh, hope you guys were able to stay awake for most of it and learn something, um, study and make good choices.